Frank Lowe's legacy as a saxophonist was that he understood the totality of the music, that it was connected to each other. I mean, he was what's known as a free improviser. But he understood that basically the totality of jazz itself is about being free. You know, so the terminology free can apply itself to the whole music. Uh, that's the premise behind what makes jazz, jazz is freedom of expression. It's just uh, musicians and listeners have preferences for whatever part of the music's evolution they want to deal with. A person might say, well, I want to express myself using bebop or hard bop or quote unquote avant-garde or fusion or creative fusion or even unfortunately elevator fusion, you know. <laughs> so um, I enjoyed talking with him about that because we used to talk a lot about jazz recordings in general and he was well versed in the different recordings in this music uh, as a collector along with being a player. But he still had his own sound. You can hear the influences but he didn't rely on trying to emulate the co the collection, you know. So I use that as an example for myself, for my own music. Infatuated by the innovators before I knew they were innovators. I didn't know that them cats were innovators. I didn't know Dolphy on that train them innovators. Train them, it just caught my ear, man. It was just like, I remember when I was a real young kid, my aunt and them people, they used to borrow my Coltrane train records. And they, they would they would liberate them, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, they thought I didn't notice. So I knew, I said, I mean, I said, okay, y'all can have that because Coltrane is going to some new stuff. He's on this label called Impulse, and I'm into some new shit. Y'all, there's some old stuff y'all into. I said, hey, 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 y'all don't know about this. You dig? I don't even know about this, right? So. Uh, I mean, cause my mom and them had Miles Davis records and stuff, you know. So, but that's how, I, that's how I heard Train on that first record. It says Miles, it's just with the, with the fence, and it got the, the fence, and it goes like out in the country. That's why I first heard Train, and, you know. And then I heard Train on this Gene Allen's record called the Big Sound, playing alto, and I was kind of. I was kind of shook up because I, I, I know this train was playing alto, but I got it because of Gene Ammons. And later on, when I took it home, I saw it say John Coltrane. I said, oh, interesting. Then I looked closer, and it was train playing alto. I said, oh, no, I'm hurt, you know. But it was a groovy record, you know. Train, I mean, really, Gene Ammons. Knock me out at the same time. Jug, man. Hitting a jug. Bop, wow. Sha do ba do be do be do ba da ba. Bop, wow. You know, one time I walked into this club, and you know they had these jukeboxes, man, right? And somebody was playing. In fact, on Sunday, I used to shoot hooky from Sunday school. You did. So instead of going to Sunday school, they had these little clubs. They called them harm houses. You did. So you go in there and they had, you know, these shakes and fries and everything. All the teenagers hung out there, you know. So instead of going to Sunday school, I go to Sunday school and then I meet my mother for church at one o'clock. So instead of going, I kept a couple of dollars in chain so I could feed the jukebox. And I listened to that until the time, time it came to meet my mother. And that's why I heard 
Aretha Franklin first. She was on Columbia singing this record. Baby, here I am by the railroad track. This, this was on Columbia, you dig? This was before she was on Atlantic, you dig? And I heard Hard Silver's early, Senior Blues, right? I heard that. And, and early, oh, early Art Blakey with Hank Mobley and, and a little later with Wayne. I heard those on the jukebox, right? And the reason they hired me at Stax Records was because I had a friend that I grew up with who had this big knowledge. He used to sing for Stax. They had a band called the Mad Lads and the Astors. They had two bands. If you look in this big, big book of them, you see their photographs and stuff. And these cats, man, when we were 14, 15, I might be 15, these cats were going, coming to New York and shit, and opening for James Brown and shit, going all around, you know, singing, t telling man they, they opened up for so and so and so and so. And man, I was so jealous, I was crazy. You know, I said, damn. But these cats can sing, I said, damn, I wish I could do this. So, in fact, I had a, a cousin who played drums really good, but he wasn't in those bands, but I was around him a lot. So, I was trying to play early, man. I, I was trying to play since I was early. But it took me a long time. I didn't make the first recording I did with Alice until I was 27 years old. But I had been trying, man, for a very long time. You understand? Like, since when I went to, first went to college, University of Kansas in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, I'm 17 or 18. I got a good teacher, this dude named Herb Smith. We, I pledged in this fraternity, and he was my, one of my big brothers in this AKA thing, right? Alpha Kappa Alpha, something like that, whatever. Yeah, so I played, his name was Herb Smith. And he happened to be an alto player. So I got me a, a really good practice schedule with, hooked up with him, you know? And later on, this guy did come to hear me play with the sax song, me and James Carter and Marcus, and I don't know, maybe Philip Wilson was on drums with that same Inappropriate Choices band, I think. This guy named Gary Window was on alto then. You heard of Gary? Yeah, yeah. used to work up in uh, the music store. Yeah, Gary Window. The first photo I took of, of Frank uh, in Central Park as part of the uh, Newport New York Festival was one that he always liked and I provided him with copies and I'm not sure what he might have used them for, but I think I gave him several copies, and uh, he looked really he looked really uh, good at that time. And my wife, in fact, would, and said, "Well, she always thought he was handsome, but uh, you know, he certainly looked so in that picture." <laughs>